Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you also to my colleagues, especially to Sif Noor, um, for helping to bring this program together, Lauren Downing for your essential administrative support and guidance, um, Meg Only for connecting me with Trevor, um, and Derek Rigsby for seamless technical support and documenting this important event. So I'm very excited to introduce Trevor Ellison and their lecture this evening. This event is part of the exhibition I curated upstairs in the project space, The Last Place They Thought Of, a presentation of work by four artists that explores the possibility of different and critical engagements with geography through the lens of black female subjectivities and feminisms. As such, I'm in absolutely thrilled to have Trevor, a scholar of geography and gender studies, contribute to this exhibition project by sharing their thoughts and responses to this exhibition. Tonight, Trevor will broadly speak about how the works of Torquasse Dyson, Jade Montserrat, Lorraine O'Grady, and Keisha Scarville deepen or reorient our understanding of place, scale, and being in the tradition of black geographies, working through a number of important thinkers and specific texts, including that of Catherine McKittrick um, and her demonic grounds, Black Women and the Cartographies of Struggle, um, which was especially integral to the development of this exhibition. Trevor will also be contributing a text to the catalog for this exhibition, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, after the lecture, there will be time for some questions, and uh, please do join us for a, a little reception outside. Um, also, there is a sign-in, sign-up sheet circulating, so if you'd like to be kept abreast of the ICA's events and programs, please sign up there. So, Trevor Ellison, uh, Assistant Professor of Geography and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Dartmouth College, is an interdisciplinary scholar whose research is at the intersections of trans and queer historiography, carceral geographies and social movements in the United States. Trevor's writing appears in places such as Transgender Studies Quarterly, Feminist Wire and Scholar and Feminist Online. Trevor is currently working on their manuscript project towards a politics of perfect disorder, which historicizes the articulation of trans and queer criminality in Los Angeles in relation to the racialization of space. Towards a politics also traces grassroots activism around anti-trans and queer policing initiatives, including how the institutionalization of such efforts shapes the contemporary landscape of trans and queer politics in Los Angeles. Trevor earned their doctorate in American Studies and Ethnicity from the University of Southern California in 2015. Please join me in welcoming Trevor this evening. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am really honored, thrilled, and a little bit nervous. I always get a little bit nervous doing public speaking. It's just a part of the process. Um, but I'm really honored to be here to respond to this exhibition. Um, I first want to start off by thanking uh, Daniela and Tasa for you know, making everything happen, for inviting me to do this, and for organizing my travel, and every yeah, making everything happen really seamlessly. Um, also want to thank Meg for putting us, me and Daniela, in touch. And I also want to thank the artists, uh, if some of them are here, whose work appears in this exhibit. Because for me, sitting with the work was really helpful um, in terms of thinking through some stuff I've been trying to think through, which is what I'm going to present to you today. So um, yeah, I will thank you in advance for your patience. This is a wild talk. It is like on the edge of what for me is articulable, but I'm really excited to think through these ideas and hopefully a discussion can ensue afterwards. All right. So the title of this talk is Vanta Power. Um, it is my, ooh. okay, that's better. It is my distinct honor and privilege to be able to think with you all and with this marvelous exhibit that Daniela has curated. Before I begin this talk, I would like to acknowledge that we are on stolen Lenape land. 
The Lenape are Northwestern indigenous people whose historical territory includes present day Eastern Pennsylvania, including this city we are in now, New Jersey, Delaware, New York City, Western Long Island, and the lower Hudson Valley. During the decades of the, 18, the, decades of the 18th century, uh, most of the Lenape were pushed off their land by European settlers. I also want to acknowledge that we are less than a mile away from the original location of the MOVE organization home at 311 North 33rd Street, which we should remember, especially during Black August, as an active site of struggle over invoking and enacting a black sense of place. The MOVE organization was a radical black eco-Africanist group started in the early 1970s by John Africa. MOVE members lived communally. Uh, they were vegans, they protested police brutality, and uh, rejected a lot of common sense beliefs in modern technology, medicine, and science. MOVE's everyday existence generated Vanta power, or the power of blackness to disorient dominant paradigms of social and spatial organization what we might call civil society. Moves everyday practices were about a reunion of body and flesh. They sought to deconstruct the, deconstruct the quote, black body and Western culture as a regulatory template and create a collective environment in which they could reckon with the social and spatial paradoxes of living in the flesh, the condition of blackness. In this instance, living within the flesh describes the indeterminate relationship between black people and nature, black people in the home, black people in urban development, historically circumscribed by iterative acts of violent displacement. Move members changed their last names to Africa, reflecting how they saw themselves as a part of a larger family shaped by their relation to the colonized, ripped apart, and torn spatially dispersed flesh of Africa, a, collect a collective condition of removal from nature, from claims to land, and from the possibility of indigeneity. Their daily existence as a collective was organized around enacting and theorizing in the flesh, or articulating and practicing new relationships to land and nature. MOVE was experimenting with radical black post-humanism and rethinking their lived daily relationship to the human way before the post-humanist turn in critical theory. Keisha Scarville's photographic work in The Last Place They Thought Of, for me, summons and enacts the complex, the complex relationship between blackness, nature, displacement, and imagination that I imagine MOVE members were confronting in their live and lived mixing of liberation theology, environmentalism, Rastafarianism, anti-racism, anti-capitalism, Afrocentrism, Afrocentrism, and black power. The, poli the Philadelphia Police Department began to harass MOVE and actively shot, sought to shut down their commune. One of the first thing MOVE members did at 311 North 33rd Street was bring over 30 cats and dogs to live with them and organized a campaign of protest against the enslavement of animals at the Philadelphia Zoo. In 1978, policeman harassment of MOVE culminated in a shootout after members refused to leave uh, the house at 311 North 33rd Street after the Philadelphia PD was a, uh, produced a court order ordering them to vacate. The group moved about two, three miles away from where we are now to a row house on 6221 Osage Avenue in 1981. They lived at that house until 1985 after complaints from neighbors reached a fever pitch. Police obtained arrest warrants charging four occupants of the house with several crimes, including making terrorist threats. The mayor classified MOVE as a terrorist organization. When members refused to evacuate the house at 6221 Os Osage, uh, other residents in the area were evacuated from the neighborhood. Water and electricity was shut off to force MOVE members out of their house uh, and to keep them from being able to eat food. Um, Commissioner Sambor read a long speech um, in this kind of standoff in, with the police in uh, May of 1985, um, addressed to MOVE members that started with, quote, attention MOVE, this is America. The standoff with police culminated in the police commissioner ordering that the compound be bombed. 
The police dropped two one-pound bombs made with explosives supplied by the FBI on the MOVE house. The ensuing fire destroyed the MOVE home, killing 11 people, six adults, and five children aged 7 to 13, and left more than six, 250 people in the neighborhood without housing. The fire destroyed 65 homes. As MOVE sought to actively unmake some of the norms of civil society, their vanta poetics revealed the way that post-war urban residential landscapes were the product of militarism at almost every scale, global warfare, the militarization of the police, and the military war against spatializing black power in the material world that we remember as co-intel-pro. Remembering what happened to MOVE reminds us that racism often takes place as an active project of violent territorialization. The territorialization is multi-scalar and ongoing. Considering the MOVE bombing should add dimensionality to how we understand stolen land within the histories of gentrification, urban renewal, and the growth of the carceral state. Land is continuously stolen through acts of violence and the malleability of indigenous land claims, the fact that they can be ignored broken and manipulated for profit is co-signed through the iterative placement of blackness and an ungeographic relationship to the law, ethics, being, and knowing. The body of the law cannot see or address the paradoxical nature of blackness because race and sex as key organizing categories of the modern world were distinctions carved out over time through knowledge production and act of, acts of violence and domination that were not just legal, but legalized. Racism is not the result of people and places being neglected by the law, but it is enshrined and produced through its development. The law aided the, com the conversion of physical human bodies of Africans into fungible flesh in the exact moment that law, rights, and the nation state form were being celebrated as the evidence of Europeans' capacity for productive reason. As Denise de Silva writes, Continental philosophy and modern ethics developed to displace the necessitas of the law, the violent nature of man, onto people and territories outside of Europe. Black people have had a paradoxical relationship to space. Black people have a paradoxical relationship to space and time because our contemporary understandings of space and time are rooted in the contradictions of modernity. The law, ethics, reason, personhood, and rights are technologies crafted to cohere civil society through the logic of ownership. States invest subjects with individual rights. People become subjects of the law and reason through the enterprises of language, written word, and history. However, the conditions that facilitated the infrastructural and ideological development of the modern world were not objective. Modern state governance were not <coughs> Sorry, modern state governance were crafted in the shape of the interest of a ruling class that evolved through the use of enslavement along the lines of ethnic or sex difference as a method of creating a class of owners and a class of surplus laborers. This strategy of racialism predates and guides the development of capitalism from feudalism into a system of what Cedric Robinson calls racial capitalism. Racial capitalism is a socialized mode of economic production that works by reproducing race through territorialization, creating political, ideological, psychic, biological, and ethical enclosures. These enclosures facilitate the extraction of people and resources. Producing race through territorialism includes the epistemological territorialization of the human body, the differentiation of the human body helped to situate subjects differently to the capacity for productive reason and therefore the, uh, the capacity for ownership. Liberal humanism has been hostile to representing the desires, memories, spatial purview, or modes of relationality of the descendants of enslaved Africans. Liberal humanism is the framework through which one assumes a body by getting rights and protections from a nation state. Under liberal humanism embodies, sorry, 
the architecture of liberal humanism often used slavery as a metaphor for their relationship between the working classes and the ruling classes of Europe, while rationalizing African enslavement and displacing African resistance to enslavement from the geography of self-consciousness and self-possession. Hegel, for example, who famously uh, invented the master-slave dialectic, a durable model of self-consciousness, self was a gradualist who did not support the abolition of slavery, even though his concept of the master-slave dialectic was inspired by the Haitian Revolution. Blackness is written out of the world constructed by liberal humanism through dominant ideals and paradigms of history, representation, language, aesthetics, morals. It is written outside the realm of political power. Blackness is the necessitas of the law, but not a subject of the law. This is why legal protections for black people in places have been so, so tenuous and yet so necessary. In order to be written into political power, black people must reckon with the social and spatial realities of racial capitalism and liberal humanism. These conditions have not stopped blackness from acting through the political or black people from building real political power through the very tools of productive reason that have been weaponized against them. And that is why I am here today to talk about blackness and power, uh, about a specific view of power that I have creatively conjured in response to the last place they thought of that I'm calling Vanta Power. Vanta power is the disruptive and transformative power of blackness. It is first and foremost an experimental idea on the run that is trying to think about power in relationship to blackness, about the power that comes from blackness and the pa paradoxes of that power. This feels like a highly appropriate exercise for Black August. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in how black people have approached questions of being and existence beyond binaries of life and death, human, non-human, that permeate theory coming from critical studies, queer and f feminist theory. The thought behind this work is in conversation with black feminist scholars and black artists and intellectuals across, um, sorry, that have always focused on ritual, practice, play, and ceremony as a femme approach to existence versus mastery and universalism. Vanta Power asks, what is the power in the petty, vain, lazy, tipsy, slick, nasty, sick, and monstrous? We have to be unmade to be made to be unmade to be made. Vanta Power is the power of blackness to confound categories and spatial arrangements. Vanta Power is meant to see and speak from the purview of black geographies, which to follow Catherine McKittrick and Clyde Woods describe how, quote, the unknowable figures into the production of space, end quote. The unknowable is the ungeographic, is the last place they thought of, the condition of blackness in the world according to racial capitalism and liberal humanism. It exists in an indeterminate relationship to space and time. Vanta Power is also a call to think and theorize power from the purview of a black female su subject position, from the purview of what my friend and colleague Jazz Riley calls the black maternal. The Vanta and Vanta Power comes from two paradoxical inspirations that reflect the paradoxes of blackness. <clears throat> the Vanta and Vanta Power is inspired first from the material Vanta Black. Vanta Black is the trademark name of a material created in 2014 by growing vertical na carbon nanotubes on a substrate. Vanta Black, owned by UK company Surrey Nanosystems, is the darkest known artificial substance, absorbing up to 99.965% of visible spectrum radiation. Potential applications for Vanta Black include disguising satellites and stealth aircraft. In February of 2016, Vanta Black became the subject of controversy in the art world when sculptor Anish Kapoor was given exclusive rights to Vanta Black as an art material by Surrey Nanosystems. Painter Christian Furr was particularly furious because he wanted to use it to create a series of paintings titled Animals. 
Fur balked at the idea that one artist could have a monopoly on a material, but Surrey affirmed Kapoor's exclusive rights in the field of art, remarking that the engineers at Surrey were great fans of his disorienting sculptures. Uh, so this is an image of Vanta Black, and you see it's like uh, Surrey, basically, Surrey Nanosystems converted Bl Vanta Black into a paint so that Anish Kapoor could use it in his sculptures, and so the uh, the figure on the left, oh, sorry, I'm bad at left and right. The figure on the right is like the same bust of that face covered in Vanta Black, and Vanta Black like distorts the contours of the face because of the way that it absorbs light. Um, what is striking to me about the argument between Four and Kapoor is that they both want to lay claim to Vanta Black because of the power of blackness to disorient, transform, and wow. Kapoor remarked to Art Forum, quote, the nanostructure of Vanta Black is so small that it virtually has no materiality. Uh, that's, that's like Vanta Black, so those vertical tubes, uh, like that's, that's it, the vertical nanotubes being grown on the substrate, sorry. Quote, the nanostructure of Vanta Black is so small that it virtually has no materiality. It's thinner than a coat of paint and rests on the liminal edge between an imagined thing and an actual one. It's a physical thing that you cannot see, giving it a transcendent or even transcendental dimension. Fur commented to Daily Mail, quote, all the best artists have had a thing for pure black. Turner, Monet, Goya, this black is like dynamite in the art world. We should be able to use it. It isn't right that it belongs to one man. What was stunning to me when I was reading this back and forth was that both, was, uh, both Furs and Kapoor's unabashed desires to both inhabit and control blackness as a material. Kapoor uses black in his work to create scenes of cognitive and spatial disorientation, and Vanta Black, the blackest black ever, presents him with the opportunity to convert his aesthetic practice into an exclusive property right. First seemingly liberal democratic retort succinctly recast the ghastliness of liberal humanism. Fur is insisting that not just one man should have the exclusive rights to Vanta Black, but everyone should have the chance to purchase and use this dynamic material. Both Kapur and Fur's desires to own blackness as an aesthetic or a material underscore the condition of blackness in Western culture as, quote, a being that is for others. In this being for others, what is abstracted is a black sense of place. What does it feel like to absorb all the light, to be the point of passage between the real and the imaginary, between materiality and nothingness? What does it mean to be constructed as a bridge for transcendence? Vanta power, in this sense, is meant to express the power that comes from blackness as it is materialized and sourced often through race, through the commodity form, and through spatial acts of enclosure and territorialization. Um, we can see quite literally the visual representation of the, of the Vanta Powerful in the work of Torquase Dyson. Uh, Dyson's paintings in this exhibit provide a, a summon the material geographies of water crises and how they are inflected by the racialization of space. Um, I really, I, yeah, I wanna pause here for a minute and look at a couple of these pieces. So. Yeah, these like, I was so, yeah, seeing these was really instructive for how I was thinking through Vanta Power. Cause so on the one hand, I really like these, uh, these paintings because you have like, you have this kind of bounded space with the white lines that kind of look like blueprints or you know, something that suggests uh, architecture. And then there's, in each of these paintings in this series, there's this kind of like, indeterminate space in the middle that's a rendering of the water table and a kind of like, you know, materialization of water crises of like, uh, one, I know that, uh, I read that uh, the artist did some deep sea diving around offshore drilling sites. I know that she worked with an environmental lawyer on a project thinking about black water infrastructure in Alabama. 
And so, uh, you know, all these things kind of come to bear in these images. Uh, and I think that, you know, thinking about how hostile certain kinds of representations are to blackness, there's something really, yeah, I really was struck by these paintings. Um, I kind of viewed them, I don't know what other people think, but given the context of like uh, offshore drilling and water and water crises, I view these as a kind of like a uh, sonogram of the flesh where, uh, you know, oil companies are working with scientists to use uh, sonography and ultrasound to like identify and find uh, oil so that they can pinpoint ex exactly where to drill. And I saw these paintings as kind of like uh, reappropriating the kind of like view frame and the visuality of the sonogram to like bring us to, yeah, to like render the water table, which is something that is indexing like multiple geographical locations and multiple like processes of power. And here are example, these are some of the, um, this is an example of the, uh, of what a sonogram, like the oil detecting sonograms look like. And then I also saw in this work and the work of Jade Montserrat, Montserrat this really um, intentional focus on, on source. So in, uh, in Dyson's work, it's thinking about water as this kind of medium of transmission and the alluviality of blackness. And then in, J in, uh, Mon in Montserrat's uh, installation, which here I can zoom out. So if you weren't able to see the exhibition, there's like a corridor where uh, the artist has inscribed like all these quotes or snippets of text onto the wall, written them and then like shaded the space behind them in black. And uh, Daniela told me that she, uh, the artist used graphite that was locally sourced. So thinking about, I saw both of these pieces as kind of really trying to meditate on like blackness as it is materialized through these commodified forms um, and the way like, like the condition of being for others um, that circumscribes blackness is one that should kind of place what I'm gonna talk about later in terms of black female subject positionality at the center of discussions of the Anthropocene. Like for me, these two works, uh, Montserrat and Dyson really affirm the way that the you know, the Anthropocene is the racial capitalist scene. It is the, the same kind of uh, relations of power that produce what we call, you know, the Anthropocene, which is a particular measure of geological time are like, you know, the conditions of blackness. So what does it mean to put, um, to like center, you know, to, to create a kind of experience that allows us to have that kind of, that conversation. Um, Vanta Black is the result of creating an environment. Sorry. Vanta Black is the result of creating an environment in which carbon can be organized in a particular spatial arrangement, the nanotube array. Similarly, racial blackness as a subject position is produced through creating an environment and sustaining an environment, racial capitalism, in which carbon-based life forms can be organized in particular spatial arrangements. Um, into the, sorry, into particular spatial arrangements, including the space of the unthought, or what geographer Kappa McKittrick calls ungeographic, a zone that hovers out of the, hovers just beyond the grasp of language. Being ungeographic does mean that, doesn't mean that you cannot be located, but it means that the tools and structures of space and placemaking have been weaponized to attempt to foreclose your ability to materialize your sense of place in the world. 
This underscores the paradox of approaching blackness and the power of blackness through the language mediated order of culture, the sign systems, aesthetic values, philosophies, and theories of form, content, and relation meant to administrate human life and embodiment through formal and deterministic judgments, classifications, and taxonomies. All right. I want to return to the second proposition, now turn to the second proposition of Vanta Power. Vanta Power is the power that comes from reuniting, reuniting body and flesh. Power is energy that is used to organize material, psychic, and representational landscapes. So Vanta Power is the capacity to organize material, psychic, and representational landscapes that emanates from a black female subject position. The second inspiration for Vanta power comes from the prefix Vanta, which denotes vanity, laziness, or lack. Black people often show up in dominant culture through these terms, lack, flag, fragmentation, displacement, deficiency, and pathology. Vanta underscores the power generated from the iterative scripting of a black female subject position, one that conditions not just black subject formation, but one that sets the terms for the reproduction of the relations of production, to quote Hortense Spillers, or in short, the reproduction of racial capitalism and liberal humanism. One of the primary strategies for presenting black people as lazy and lack is to position them in an indeterminate relationship to normative ideals of the human body and human sexuality. This rendering for me is exemplified in the figure of the welfare queen, the castrating mother figure. For example, in the late 1940s, decades before Ray Reagan's famous rendering of the welfare queen, Lucy Hicks Anderson, a black gender nonconforming femme socialite brothel owner and domestic worker living in Oxnard, California, was prosecuted and convicted on federal, char federal fraud charges for accepting an allotment check as the legally married wife of the US Army because she was not a biological woman. Lucy Hicks, Anderson Lucy Hicks Anderson's arrest exemplifies the kind of queer uses of family, marriage, kinship, and state resources that constitute the source of Vanta power. Vanta power is the capacity generated for US state governance that comes from iteratively remaking the figure of the welfare queen. The iterative crafting of this figure through policing and criminalization should place black female subject positionality at the center of all of our conversations on neoliberal development and restructuring black life and the nature of matter. The Vanta the vein in Vanta also indexes how black people like Lucy Hicks Anderson have made queer use of dominant social and spatial structures and how these queer uses are often unacknowledged as black power. With this inspiration, I wanted to think through the power of having a vain, lazy, or lacking orientation to the enterprises of being and no to enterprises of being and knowing that are hostile to you. To exist in this zone Sorry, to exist in the zone, in this zone is not an easy process and it can also be very dangerous. It is often violent or painful and survival is not guaranteed. In articulating Vanta power, I'm interested in creating, uh, in articulating Vanta power, I'm interested in creating a self-referential language for black female subject positionality within a field of power. That is to say, Vanta power refers to itself. It is a power from and of and not a power to, which implies a subject and object positions. It has no subjects that are not objects. This is because Vanta power is the power that comes from the crossing between subject and object, from being bridge, being water, being trans. My desire to come up with a descriptor of power that is self-referential in relationship to a black female subject position is underwritten by the ways that the zone of the flesh has often been violently overrepresented through the form of black womanhood, where woman is meant to affirm the biological categories of the state and civil society. 
charting the trajectories of Vanta power, the power that comes from ritual unions of body and flesh could constitute an approach to black feminism that is divested from reproducing the racist logics of biological sex. To intentionally reunite To intentionally reunite body and flesh is to come to terms with what Hortense Spillers has called the hieroglyphs of the flesh, the often painful and violent markings that have shaped the position of racial blackness in modern culture. Vanta power is a model of power from the perspective of a black female subject position, which is one of indeterminacy. To occupy a black female subject position is to exist in an indeterminate relationship to the categories and ideals of being under liberal humanism like agency, presence, self-determination, rights. Black female subject positionality is an ongoing project that has and continues to constitute how we know the world. Living in the flesh means grappling with the ways that black people have been rendered as ungeographic. Thinking both with McKittrick and Spillers, being rendered ungeographic means that the normative tools of language, representation, and placemaking lack efficacy in terms of expressing black people's sense of place. Um, ungeographic describes the spatial dimensions of living in the flesh or in proximity to the embodied cultural memory of anti-black racism that is an active production. This is the last place they thought of, not because they didn't think to look there, but because it is so layered, thick, and palimpestic that the tools of thought fail to address it with efficacy. Vanta power is a call to see and recognize the disorienting power of the black femme's flight, who when, as Kara Keeling writes, she appears should make us stop and think differently about the organization of the world as we know it. Ritual unions and disunions of body and flesh animate traditional modes of power like biopower, necropower, disciplinary power, and, and anatomo power. Um, they animate the terms of social and spatial order like belonging, family, body, home, community, and citizenship. But Vanta power is also summoned, conjured to create scenes of black feminist fugitivity. It is the power of Harriet Tubman, Asada Shakur, to transtemporally participate in the active, painful, and dangerous unmaking and remaking of Western civilization. Vanta power comes from the last place they thought of, the place between, a zone of ethical absence. When Vanta power is conjured to create scenes of black feminist fugitivity, it is a locational project that disavows locating through the coordinate systems of liberal humanism. Learning to see Vanta Power reveals black feminist geographies if we understand black feminism as the improvisational, dangerous, and urgent work of living in the flesh, living with the flesh in the indeterminate zone of blackness and refusing to violently displace people into that zone in exchange for inhabiting a body that is representable with efficacy through the codes, taxonomies, and value systems of Western civilization. Black feminism is saying yes to the female within, acknowledging the power of black female subject positionality as the power of blackness. All of the works uh, to me in this exhibit do this in the way that they evince the creation of practices and existence that privilege hacking, experimentation, vulnerability, risk, and sociality over identification, representation, and ontology. They chart the trajectories of Vanta power by exploring how it shows up in the material world, the water tables of the Gulf South, the forests of the northeastern US and dialogue with Guiana, and the intellectual work of black writers and thinkers. Um, what time is it? Sorry. Okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna stop there and open it up for questions and maybe like we can have a discussion about the different work, like, yeah, we can have a back and forth dialogue about uh, how these different works like events van to power and try to like 
do something with the concept. Thank you all. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Oh, thank you. That makes it a lot easier. All right, thanks. Um, so you you talked about um, um, maybe a, an invasion of labelism. Um, uh, can you hear me? An invasion of of labels oh. or labelism when it comes to blackness or Vanta power. Um, I guess my question for you is that, uh, to put some context in it, that I feel like blackness looks really different, like is a varied spectrum in reality. Um, so how with the beauty of Vantapower being a color or being the darkness, how do you address the spectrum of blackness through Vantapower? Also, like with eva with evasion, because there's a lot of evasion from it, mm -hmm. and I'm just saying, like, if we could if we could change that into instead of evade the need to evade an identity, to embrace an identity that is also open ended or addressing the spectrum. Yeah. So I guess that's a great question. I think one of the ways I see Vanta power or the Vanta poetical like evading labels. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Like in this work, in the slide that I'm stopped on, like this, so this, uh, there's this 18 minute video that Lorraine or uh, O'Grady did called Western Hemisphere, and it's called Western Hemisphere, but for 18 minutes we kind of take a journey through her scalp. So I think one, it's about like really, right, like in all, what is notable is that all the works in this exhibition kind of do interesting things with the body, like they never present it in a kind of full, recognizable, identifiable form. Like Keisha's work is kind of playing with blackness as the quality of light and, and darkness as a quality of light in which to like understand, um, you know, to, to rethink embodiment and to like capture, you know, photographically the possibilities of embodiment mm -hmm. as, you know, you as she like, uh, I read that she made these photographs kind of through the whole course of the night, like going into the forest when it was starting to get, to get dark and then like letting, you know, uh, taking these photos at various stages mm -hmm. of the darkness to think about what it is like to kind of co-become with darkness. So I think like that's one example of how people are using Vanta power to resist labels. Like, I think about Turquoise's work, like she could have, you know, tried to like recreate, you know, the scene of extraction and be like, look, here, like here's where something bad is. But in trying to like render the water table through these like, I'm thinking about them as fleshly sonograms, it's kind of like really resisting like a neat kind of identification. So I think that's one way. And I would say, because I think blackness is not about identity. Like identity is like, to me, you know, something that you have to reckon with in a liberal humanist capitalist framework because you need to be identified, you know, like uh, the logic of, you know, the logics that sustain liberal humanism are all about formalizing the world like classifying things in the world and ranking them to create systems of value. And so like, how do you not do that? I think actually each of the artists in this uh, exhibition are exploring that. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Hi, uh, Cheva, thank you so much. I'm so excited about what you're doing and that was a great talk. Um, so I have 2.5 questions, and you can maybe choose one of them or something. Um, so the first question that I have is, you said that Vanta Poetics is about spatializing black power. Um, and then when you were showing us the Vanta black, 
Um, some of it was about disorientation, which I think is what you were getting at. But there's also a way that it despatializes, right? Like it, it makes depth perception deceptive. Um, so I want, I'm uh, prompting you to think a little bit about the way that depth the way that space becomes deceptive with mm. Vanta power, but the way that it is also insisting on a spatialization of black power. Um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, um, really I wanted you to go back to, I think that was Adrian uh, and Adrian Piper work that you mm -hmm. showed when you were talking about self-referential. And I kind of just want to prompt you to talk a little bit about why you chose that uh, that work. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I like this, what you said about here for the first question, you were saying like, <coughs> Vanta Black kind of disorients by despatializing, by, you know, like, it's like you thought you knew what depth perception was and now you can't see this guy's face. And so I think like, right, like in all, like even, Thinking about uh, Jade Montserrat's work about how, like, you know, first there's the letters and then she goes through and like out like outlines them in black. For me, this is like a practice of trying to like despatialize the um, the like kind of canon of the word and think about the movement of blackness as the things that allow the words to be seen and visible. So in that way, I think like when Vanta Power is summoned to create scenes of black feminist fugitivity, it is trying to do the work to despatialize the logics of like liberal humanism and racial capitalism. Uh, is, does that sort of begin to answer your question? Yeah. We can come back, we can come back. Okay. And then <laughs> to your second question, I picked this, I saw this, um, I saw this at Adrian Piper's retrospective mm -hmm. at MoMA and I just like, I thought it was great. So it was like, the, there's an eight by eight grid, uh, and so it's there's 64 spots, and so there's a whole book where in each one of these little block, each one of these little circles, uh, she says here, and he describes like the, like the the she just tries to describe the box, and when I I was like so struck by this, and the way like the graph paper as a representation of a kind of Cartesian coordinate system and a Cartesian plane appears throughout her work. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of it, it's like, now she's not even trying to fit within these like little boxes. She's just like screen printing stuff and messages on top of it. But I was really struck by this one, because, uh, and I read about it and she said, you know, Adrian Piper has this concept of the indexical presence. And she said, she was trying to come up with a self-referential, a language in this piece, in this particular piece that only referred to itself. And that was really inspirational for me because right, Horst Tim Spiller says that like, when she talks about black female subject positionality, she says that the individual pronoun has a collective function and that part of the way that the tools of productive reason are weaponized against black people is that it becomes hard, right? Uh, thinking through her and Sadia Hartman's work, like if we look in the archive of slavery, it's like impossible to biographize uh, for, you know, like black women to have a biography uh, or it's, it's not impossible, but it's really difficult to glean biography. And so I was, in, I was like enchanted by this idea of Adrian Piper to like, create, when we talk about blackness in relationship to power, it's always like through a terms of disempowerment, even the term anti-blackness. But I wanted to come up with Vanta power as a self-referential language that referred to the power of blackness. Because right, that's the whole, like, that's the whole crux of black, like the paradoxical nature of blackness. It's like both hyper surveilled, but then exist without any like actual locations or coordinates, especially in this Cartesian model of locating things because it needs like it needs to be that kind of amorphous so that it can do the work of providing the kind of contour or the backdrop for being for uh, yeah, like for assuming a body in the way that assuming a body means being like being recognized by certain kind of hierarchies of power. So that's why, that's why I went to, like this is why I showed this because this work was really inspirational 
thinking through with the other works in this exhibition, trying to like come up with, um, yeah, like a term that could refer to the power that comes from black female subject positionality instead of always having, like, it's never at the center of power. Like, biopower is the power to administrate life. Where do we locate the black female subject positionality within? Like, we can, but it, do, it doesn't often happen. Or like, uh, necropower, even that's supposed to be like the black rebuttal to biopower is just like the power to kill. <laughs> Oh, and I was like, the power that emanates from a black female subject position is more capacious and complex to me than th what those two descriptions of power allow for, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Trevor. Hi. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about um, just how you came across this this color, the Vanta black. And like I was really interested when you were talking about the conditions in which it was produced. It was thought to be this tool for surveillance that you could cover up drones with it so that you could better surveil. Or um, then there's also like this, these debates around, you know, how profitable can this color be and like who can own it and so I was just really interested in, in um, kind of your process in choosing this color and like this product. And if you, um, if it was your intention to kind of just like flip, the, like choose something that you could flip around to then say like, okay, by the very nature of like this being a product of racial capitalism, we can kind of pick up on this and use it for something else that's like, I think that was yeah. my process. I think okay. you just described <laughs> my process. But I could talk a little, yeah, like I don't, I'm trying to remember of when I came, I think I just, you know, I was scrolling on the internet and saw this posted on someone's Facebook and it was like, Vanta Black, the blackest black ever. And I think this is also in the temporality of like, gay is the new black. And I was like, wow, like blackness is so necessary as a, like a referential for other things to be kind of brought into being. And so I, it, start, it started there and then I was like, okay, what is, like, what is this prefix Vanta, vertically aligned carbon nanotubes. So then I was, yeah, thinking about, right, like, Vanta black is not a color, it's a material. And that, I thought that was really interesting to me. And then when I read what Anish Kapoor like had to say about Vanta black and like what, um, yeah, like when I read his descriptions of like why it would be so useful to him, that also like kind of was like, ah, I really was trying to, I don't, does, that, does that begin to answer yes. your question? Okay. <laughs> Was there anything that was unclear? We can talk, like, we can talk, you all. Hi, again, Jessica, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate your uh, description of Vanta Black power as being something that doesn't necessarily need to be described or explained, or that the material itself is so otherworldly that it, it's not, it's less about describing or explaining why it has all these properties, which I think transfers to blackness in a lot of the ways that you've described as having a sort of um, ambiguousness to it in that it doesn't have to be explained for anybody and that there is a depth perception problem there and that's supposed to be there, and it's called mystery, and it's called more than you might, like you have to find out for yourself, which I really appreciate, so. Thank thanks. you, that was really like inspired by reading through Catherine McKittrick's work, and so she has this book called Demonic Grounds, and the title of this exhibit, The Last Place They Thought Of, is the title of one of the chapters of the book, and in that chapter, she starts with telling the story of uh, Harriet Jacobs, who was like, um, you know, does, is everyone familiar with the story who like escaped by like hiding in a closet for years? 
and so she, the garret, sorry, not a closet, a garret. And she, and she develops this concept of garreting to think about, like, to use garreting to think about the kind of paradoxes of, um, like, black women's relationship to space and to, like, asserting, you know, their desires and their thoughts within space. And so that was, I think that was really informative in terms of trying to think about along the terms that you just said. Other questions, comments? I feel like maybe my question is like, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> is, the, is, a, is, is answered by the previous question, but maybe I'll ask it anyway. Because my mind is a lot less poetic than yours, so. Um, so I'm thinking, so I, I, I really enjoyed it. I like the, um, the idea of the of, uh, Fanta Power as like um, emanating from black female subjectivity. Um, um, and then the, the question that I w was wondering about is, um, were you thinking about both the, um, the power that is uh, seen from uh, other places, in other words, um, there is a, a way that uh, black female subjectivity is something that um, could be feared or, you know, tried to be, you know, boxed in various different ways. So is it both that and um, one that's a power that's more fugitive? Or are you thinking more about the fugitive power? I think I'm trying to think about them both with these, prop with these propositions, like that one, it's the, and thinking about the move example, like of course, I think I, maybe I like fumbled through that part, but I talked about how like Vanta Power can like, can and often is, I think about it as an energy that emanates, that can be siphoned off into other kind of like mechanisms of power, like biopower or necropower, which is about like the state sovereign power to, to kill, to maim that we see, you know, every day in the news with, policing and criminalization and, you know, like, I mean, I feel like that's everything <laughs> this country is about. Um, so, yeah, I am trying to think about those two, like, those two capacities, but not try to, like, I don't know, I'm not, tr not trying to bracket them through the terms of, like, resistance or refusal, because I think sometimes when you do that, you don't, there's things that you don't see is to be succinct. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, well, this is like, that's kind of me bringing in the stuff I'm thinking about in my book project, which is more concerned with, uh, and, like, and I think that comes in, sorry, let me back up. So yeah, that story, Lucy Hicks, about Lucy Hicks Anderson, I first encountered on a blog called uh, Trans Grio that's maintained by Monica Roberts, where she tries, like, it's like a trans history recovery project. So I read about Lucy, and I did some, like, newspaper research to just learn a little bit more about her. And then also, uh, Riley Snorton writes about her, her story as well in his new book, Black on Both Sides. So that was also really, you know, like, so I'm also thinking with Riley. Um, and I was just striking to me, right, that, to me, thinking about Lucy Hicks Anderson and the way that she was disciplined was like, this is where the queen and welfare queen literally comes from. Like, and so we can't, like, we, like if we read like black gender nonconforming femmes into the like canon of black women's history, I think it really like deepens, you know, what, what it really means. Like what are the kind of core mechanisms of instituting a black female subject positionality? And so that's, yeah, that's like what, sorry, it's hard to see your face because of the way the lights are, but that's, that's what, does that begin to answer your question? Yeah, so okay. I was trying to take that resource connection to um, the contract, um, which like, you know, yeah, I guess for me, like, 
when I think about what it means, like the mechanisms of a black female subjectivity are about like rent, displacing some, displacing people or groups of people, but main, mostly <laughs> black people like into the indeterminate zone of the flesh. And like right, Hortense Spiller says, before there is the body, there is the flesh. But the flesh doesn't just exist. It has to be like, like reproduced over time. It's like an ongoing active project. Uh, and that's why to me subject, like when we talk about race as territorialization, like subject formation to me under racial capitalism is an act of territorialization. Because in order to inhabit the territory of the body, you are like asked in all these various ways to like subject the flesh to, to either repress it as a site of subjugated, yeah, to like repress its knowledge or to like, yeah, to disavow it. I think like what we call toxic masculinity in like among black men is like the displacement of, of black female positionality onto the form of the woman. Um, and so, yeah, for me, like black subject, like the core mechanism of territorialization that constitutes black subject from positionality for spillers, like I'm thinking with Hortense Spillers, is like kind of being made into an object for other people's use, which to me, like, right, it, re it rewrites like the story of capital man becoming the master of like lowercase in nature. It's like that, it's that same separation. So that's why for me, like, there's something really you know, I don't know if it was appropriate, but there's something really like exciting for me about uh, reading Torquasse Dyson's work as like a kind of sonogram of, of the flesh, given the ways that sonograms have been used to kind of determine and make judgments about like the development of the human body to like judge the sex of the baby in the, in the woman's belly. And now sonograms are used to like determine the presence of oil and the kind of like underground belly of the ocean so that people, so that oil companies can go extract uh, that. So that, yeah, there was something to me about like the way that that work is actually exploring a black subject, a black female subject positionality without like totally just like taken away from the form of the woman that I found like not totally taken away though, right? Because then when you start to think about Right, you can't like you can't do that because then you have to you have to remember and recall the kind of violence of displacing like the flesh onto that form. So it's not about totally removing it, but trying to think outside, like trying to think with to recall the histories of violence, but not to re-naturalize them. So like that's kind of how I saw that. Or for me, if there were to be like, you know, if I really wanted to think with Foucault and be like, there are four figures of bio of Vanta power. They might be like the water, the shadow that we see in Keisha's work. I haven't come up with the other two, but you know, I like if I really started to think like that, like it would be un it, it would be under those terms that I saw at least being like offered to us in this work, if that makes sense. I, uh, thank you so much for the talk, and um, I think there's so many ways that you um, are talking about um, space and time, geography and time, like in your discussion also. So um, I guess I was wondering if you had more thoughts. When I was thinking through the ways, like the last place they thought of, and also with the Lorraine O'Grady landscape as um, certainly in sort of aesthetic histories uh, as being a way to kind of fix a particular moment in time, to fix a period or to, to kind of romanticism and to, to some, somehow refuse a certain um, trajectory of movement or change. Um, so I was just wondering if for you, either in your reflections on the show or the, the things you're thinking around Vanta Power, um, yeah, maybe I just to a ask you a little bit how time com comes up for you. I, I was thinking, I guess, as you were talking about the difference between durational time and pr progressive or historical or, or mm -hmm. sort of, um, so. Yeah, that's a really excellent question and kind of like at the l like limit of my thinking, so I like, I like it. I like those kind <laughs> of questions. I guess like, 
let's see, live theorization. I would say, <laughs> yeah, I would, well, one of the things I was thinking about time thing, it's like slipping out of my head, but I was right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, well, one of the things I was thinking about uh, time is, right, like this temporality called that, like you get from reading Sadia Hartman and Hortense Spiller's work of the afterlife of slavery and this, this being a kind of temporality that confounds uh, progressive time. And I was rereading Stuart Hall's like encoding and decoding and he has this line where he's like, in order, in order for like, in order for something to become an event, it must first have a story. And so like, I think about, right, like the event, yeah, like, the event, like the eventfulness, the afterlife of slavery, that kind of temporality is cohered around the fact that like the eventfulness of it is still apparently like op open to discussion, right? Of like, you know, like what kind of event it is and like what, you know, I work at Dartmouth. I literally a few weeks ago or months ago attended a debate that was like a very serious, like straightforward debate around the question uh, did slavery contribute to the development of the modern world? Sorry. I was just like, seriously, like, are y'all for real? So like, yeah, like, so oh, that's where, that's where I'm at at time, but I really appreciate your question because I do think, I need to think that through some more, but yeah, I think there is, yeah, there is something about like Vanta power, right, that is like asking us to to me, one, like, especially in Turquoise Dyson's work, like, a rethinking of this thing called geological time. Like, for me to put the black female subject positionality at the center of our discussion of the Anthropocene literally changes how we think about geological time and this kind of rendering of geological time that is called the Anthropocene. So that's, those are my time thoughts. For, thank you for that question, though. That's really good. Great, great, great talk. Um, just thinking about, I guess this is a question and a statement in relationship to The Last Place They Thought Of, McKendrick's work, and the Garrett, and this idea of like nature and space. So one of the things about Harriet Jacobs being in that Garrett for eight years is that she took an object and start burrowing a hole in that space. And in that hole, what she did was emit, started to emit light in the hole and sound, right? So, um, so that's one thing. So thinking about time as um, short and long, thinking about in time in relationship to violence, slow violence, fast violence. Um, I think it, 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 it's an interesting kind of way to make possible um, an argument for both frontality, duration, what does it mean to make something in the round, and what does it mean to sort of an experience an art object, right? Mm -hmm. So how does Lor Lorraine O'Grady's piece in relationship to the photographs, in relationship to the text, you know, mm -hmm. use the body as a way to think about time, witnessing, not witnessing, but viewing, and, and um, kind of the conditions of movement. So just to think about the title of the show, the way in which the Garrett functioned as a space over time um, to have access to our children, to have access to sound, and access to um, seasons changing in the way the sort of hair like moves into the space. So all these mm. things in relationship to time is something that also connotes geographic you know, violence in, in response to that. So I just, just to think about, I'm asking you. <laughs> is I was that like, a is question? That a that was a, yeah, that was a kind of a question. What do you think about that? I think my short answer is yeah, yes. <laughs> um, sorry, to say, you said using a body as a way. I mean, I think looking through the exhibit. Mm. <laughs> I was like, 
So in the wake, what is still reverberating? Is that the question? I, yeah, I, I don't know what to respond to that except yes, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do other people have any comments, thoughts? That was like, I thank you for, that was a really helpful way to think about this question about time um, <clears throat> in the space of the Garrett. Yeah. Thinking about slow violence versus fast violence. Yeah. Yeah, uh, other people that besides me should talk at this point. <laughs> Did I see someone? Did you have your hand in the back? Oh, sorry. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, just like comment slash question about temporality. Um, I'm wondering, uh, how do you think about temporality in the context of mourning, right? Um, particularly like mourning for, mourning as a sort of social practice for folks who occupy conditions of blackness, but also like corporeally black people. Um, how does time, if at all, shape blackness in those moments, in, in times of mourning, if it shapes blackness at all, and how how is that shaping made legible to a public that might not be a part of that like social process? Or is it made legible and, or is that necessary? Hmm. How does, your question is how does- How is time shaping shape mourning, mourning? Um, particularly in the context of blackness? This is a really good question. I mean, I don't know what's coming to mind is like, the t like, how does... And this is not like a question for you to give clearly like a yes or no answer. How does it's temporality dialogic. shape mourning? I don't know, I feel like, well, I don't know. I need to sit with that question. I'll s I need to sit with that, but it's, it's a really, Good question. I think what's coming to mind is like, what is my question back is like, what is what is the not time of mourning? I think what feels like the not time is the moments of disregard. Like, I don't know, say someone is recovering or, or this process of mourning was brought on by the death or the murder of a black person. And so in those time, in those moments, um, it seems in the contemporary moment, I won't say contemporary, but in the 21st century, in this century, what seems to happen is, let's say a mother is grieving the loss of her child being killed at the hands of the state. That grief is taken and turned into a political tool. Um, but the subjectivity of that mother and that family and those people who are mourning looks like something else. And I'm wondering, mm. what, I'm, what I'm getting at is how those two scenarios are made temporally different. Because to politicize something that is on the one hand always already politicized, but is also, I think, occupying another, another social life for that mother who's mourning um, 
is legible in certain ways, but also illegible in other ways. Um, and, and I'm really interested in like what temporality looks like in those two different scenarios, the political use of grief, um, and then the sort of private, non-legible, or the social life, the active social life of that grief for the people who are familiar with that black person who was killed. What? So, uh, right, there is, there, is, there is this sort of wave of non-mourning, mm -hmm. right? So you can look at black music, you can look at um, Emmett Till, you can look at these different conditions in which your question kind of evolves based on media, medium, action, but in, and also kind of black sociality. So if you look at the club, instead of a party as a space of mourning, mm. what, is that, what does that mean? And you know, and I think that the, the reason why like this club is important, the, the, the sort of brothel is important, the, the collective is important, all of these spaces are conditioned to deal with mourning both immediate and long term, right? So you positioned us with a Venn diagram to deal with both mourning as something that immediate, let's say like a Mahalia Jackson whale, and then like a Emmett Till photograph, right? Mm -hmm. And then even more recently, um, the con and we know it's gonna continue, right? We, this idea of this ongoingness in proximity, because that's what I guess you're asking, one part of it, right? <laughs> but you've positioned us in this diagram to say, okay, well, you know, what does it mean to have something immediate and what does it mean to suffer under this kind of duration? in our proximity to the incident, the mother, mm -hmm. and then the wake of that, right? And it's the job of the theorist, the artist, everyone to sort of respond based on proximity, pulling it close, pushing it further, abstracting it, illustrating it, but you have it, there, there it is. <laughs> You've done it for us. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Other thoughts? I love, yeah, I love the discussion. So were you trying to say that there's a certain kind of mourning that becomes illegible? Yeah, I like I guess it, thinking about the terms of this exhibit and the way that like the more I don't know, maybe this is true or not, but like I see that kind of private sense of mourning perhaps in Jade's piece cuz I don't know if this is true, but it seems like the the viewer like we get to see the wake of her process. Like we don't get to sit there and like watch her or is that true? Yeah, no, you're right, yeah. Yeah, like we don't get to sit there and like watch her color in <laughs> the space between all these letters. And I kind of, I don't know, I could, could, I like see that as a kind of like ritual that's trying to reunite body and flesh. Cause most of the passages in that corridor are kind of like about <clears throat> the way that, you know, black people's like lack of an efficacious relationship to embodiment. And so it's like both summoning this kind of painful, history and relationship to embodiment but then she is controlling the terms and like it's like maybe we 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 see the abstracted form of that mourning in the strokes of the car like in the strokes of the carbon of the graphite that she uses to color the walls 
but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't need to necessarily, this is why I think, you know, the art practice is an abstraction and trying to develop these abstract languages for like, or what uh, uh, Turquoise Dyson calls like black compositional thought, like trying to develop these kind of like language, visual, practical, ritual languages for me is really important. And it's like that, like, in my view, it is it is that kind of work that often doesn't get thought of as a source of black power. But I think with Vanta power, I'm trying to argue that it in fact, it, it, it is like the power of blackness. It is like the way that blackness can be summoned to create uh, thinking with Alexis Pauling Gum's scenes of black feminist fugitivity. Okay. Thank you so much, Trevor. Thank I think we all. should leave it there. We've got a reception outside.